freue mich sehr, Ihnen jetzt Professorin Geraldine Fitzpatrick vorzustellen. Sie ist Leiterin der Human-Computer Interaction Group der TU Wien und sie forscht an der Schnittstelle zwischen Sozialwissenschaften und Informatik. Unter anderem setzt sie sich das Ziel, soziale Interaktionen in alltäglichen Kontexten mit Hilfe von mobilen, physischen und sensorbasierten Technologien zu verbessern. Ihr Interesse an neuen Technologien gilt vor allem der Förderung von Gesundheit und Wohlbefinden, dem Aufbau von Gemeinschaften und der aktiven Partizipation älterer Menschen. Was braucht es also, um gute Technologien zu entwickeln? Technologien, die die Bedürfnisse aller Beteiligten einbeziehen. Geraldine Fitzpatrick wird uns zeigen, dass nicht nur die technische Entwicklung herausfordernd ist, auch die Verbreitung der Technologien ist ein schwieriges und komplexes Unterfangen. Viele Technologien sind schon längst verfügbar, ohne breite Verwendung zu finden. Wenn es nicht nur an der Verfügbarkeit liegt, welche weiteren Faktoren bestimmen den technologischen Wandel einer Gesellschaft? Im ersten Video dieser Lektion wird Geraldine Fitzpatrick auf diese Faktoren eingehen und sie am Beispiel der Telemedizin verdeutlichen. So designing good technologies is challenging, especially if we want to do it in a responsible way and be accountable to the needs of all the people involved. And we'll see across these chapters that getting technology into widespread use is much more than simply a technical challenge. We're going to take healthcare as an example application area here to illustrate this. And in later chapters, we're going to focus on the example of older people and care at home. But to start us off here in this chapter, we're going to talk about the challenge of getting one particular technology into use, and that's video conferencing for medical consultations. And I chose video conferencing because it's been critical, hasn't it, to enable us to respond to the challenges of COVID, especially during lockdown. So suddenly all our teaching went online. Um, parents and teachers and students needed to work out how to do school classes from home. And we could at least see our friends and families over video conferencing, even if we couldn't physically meet. And we were also encouraged to avoid going to our doctors and instead have medical consultations online over video conferencing um, and in the research literature, you may hear words, or in, in government and industry websites, you may hear words like telemedicine or telehealth or e-health. We won't go into the specific details of the differences. It doesn't matter here. But the point is that um, we were lucky in some way, weren't we, that the applications like Skype and FaceTime and Zoom and Teams were there for us to use even if we did find them a bit challenging at times. And I, I'm sure you've all heard the term uh, Zoom fatigue and experienced that directly. But have you ever stopped to ask yourself, why weren't we already using these technologies more, especially given that they've been there? And how long have they been there for? So I'd ask you to think about when do you think the first remote medical consultations took place? And I say remote because we can go back to the invention of the telephone by Alexander Graham Bell back in 1876. And the first documented use of a telephone for delivering remote medical consultations was reported in the Lancet Medical Journal in 1879. And they talked about a doctor diagnosing a child over the phone at night. And this issue went on to talk about the potential of this technology for remote patient care to avoid unnecessary house visits by doctors. So this was back in the 1870s. In Australia, where I come from, there's a long history of remote consultations as well. And here over radio, and this started in 1929 with the advent of the Royal Flying Doctor Service. And so there's been a long history of remote consultations before we even got to video conferencing. And most of the experiments were continuing to use audio and 
visuals and some, you know, sort of more larger scale video conferencing systems were used in the 60s and 70s. But it wasn't until the 1980s, 1990s that video conferencing became a much more viable, affordable, practical option. And this was enabled by the advent of things like our networked desktop computers and the World Wide Web and off-the-shelf video conferencing uh, little technologies that we could easily buy. And indeed, in the 1990s, I was involved in a telemedicine project in Australia where we tried to connect intensive care units of hospitals in um, the country areas of Australia to the major cities so that we could stop patients needing to be transported to the major city for care and that doctors could receive support over the video conferencing. So care and consultations over video conferencing has been practically possible for a long time now. But what do you think is the percentage of online consultations that took place before COVID? Well, from studies in countries like the US and Australia, it was only around 1%. And then COVID hit. And we suddenly needed solutions to address the challenges of physical distancing and to try to stop cross infections. And suddenly online consultations increased from 1% to over 30% of all consultations. In Austria here, there's a recent study that reported 33% of consultations were taking place on video conferencing. So that increase from 1% to 30% plus, even though the technology has always been there and in fact has got much better than the 1990s, it took a crisis to make it get used. And Milton Friedman, a 20th century economist, said in 1982, to quote him, only a crisis, actual or perceived, produces real change. And when that crisis occurs, the actions that are taken depend on the ideas that are lying around. That, I believe, is our basic function, to develop alternatives to existing policies, to keep them alive and available until the pro politically impossible becomes the politically inevitable. And I think, end of quote, and I think we could interpret that also for video conferencing for healthcare. It's been one of those ideas that's been lying around since the 19th century and kept alive by ongoing development and also kept alive by use in businesses in particular in more recent years. But it took the crisis of, the, of COVID and the pandemic to start to get much more uptake and use for medical consultations. So what's going on? Why did we not see wider uptake despite the promises that were made right back in the 19th century and the availability of this technology. It tells us that the challenges of getting good technology into use that actually fits, that gets used, that's useful, is much more than a technical problem. In some ways, however complex, that's the easy part. Studies that have been conducted both pre- and post-COVID point to very similar issues around acceptance and fit although the trend is you know, understandably improving with the COVID experiences. So from the patient's perspective, while they might appreciate the fact that they don't have to travel to the doctor anymore, they struggle with issues of trust and the concern about not having that real human contact. For the doctors involved, they're concerned about if they can really make a good diagnosis and, and decide on good treatment if they can't see the whole body and can't read body language or can't perform physical examinations. And it also requires very different work practices because video conferencing is a very different medium to face-to-face. -to -face. So that means for both patients and doctors, there's a big learning curve. There's the basic technical skills to understand how to use the technology. And for doctors also, there's a whole learning curve about what sort of conditions is this medium best suited to. From the institutional point of view, there are lots of practical issues as well, and they're to do with things like, do we have the space to set this up and the equipment? Have we got the budget that we can buy the equipment? Do we have stable internet and bandwidth? 
What new policies and procedures do we need to put in place? How do we train people? How do we maintain the equipment? You can see that it's a really complex space. And then there are the systemic policy level issues around what's the legal liability or insurance and, and reimbursement issues and government funding issues. And of course, there's also personal preferences. The same doctor, doctors seeing patients for the same conditions using the same technologies all have different experiences and different personal preferences. So all of this just suggests that the factors are not just technical. They're social, they're professional, they're organisational, they're political, they're legal, they're infrastructural, they're architectural even. And this connects to our themes around responsibility and accountability. What's the responsibility we have when we think about designing new technologies to take into account all of these broader issues that we need to be concerned with if we're going to put technology to work in real work contexts? And how do we hold ourselves accountable to the diverse stakeholders and people involved and organisations involved who will be impacted by or have to use the technologies? And how do we move from what's technically possible to more widespread uptake and use without relying on the next crisis to make that happen? Often a big part of this is countering the utopian visions of all that technology can solve um, and putting against it the realities of everyday life and the complexities that are there. And this is none more so than in the area of technologies for ageing and care. And this will be the focus for our next chapters, how we're currently thinking about technologies for older people and care and how we might think differently, more responsibly. And we'll start in the next chapter to explore what we mean when we say ageing and argue that how we conceptualise who and what we're designing for really matters. <laughs>